with this veedle that Brother Deans has here with the, uh, the stream in this live, uh, we've had as of 5 o'clock, there's 101 views of church this morning. Um, yeah. 101. So we had, what did we have, 50 in church this morning? We actually had 150 in church this morning. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So um, we're looking into doing this. Um, I ordered a, a camera holder for us today to hold our, uh, my wife's uh, camera phone and uh lord willing we're going to start doing this because i mean we can put that it don't cost anything you stream it right to the web they can watch it live it goes yeah. archived and people can watch our videos you know whenever like i said we had 101 views of our service this morning that's 101 people and if we do our church services i mean that's how many times people are going to see that all over the world you're going to see souls saved hopefully people encouraged who knows what that may Amen. Uh, bring. So just Amen. So for us for wisdom. We're going to start for, with probably with the Veedal, uh, with just a phone because we have all that stuff. But future we may go to just getting a video camera and setting up a video camera and doing it through a laptop. Uh, there's a lot, you, know, you can get a lot better view uh, with that. So we may do that in the future, but then we have to get internet here at the church, which we've been thinking about anyway. But, you know, just to get us going, we're going to do this. Uh, we're also going to be, I'm also going to update the website. Um, I got an old friend of mine that does that for a living. He's a, he's a born-again believer, Bible believer down in Florida. And I'm going to contact him about getting our website up to date and, and make that thing special, make it good and put videos on there and, and all kinds of stuff on there as well because we really need to get, you know, with it. You know, that's, that's the best way to do it is via Internet. Amen. Hey, guys, it uh, some, it was you, Dave, asked uh, how do people find out. Uh, before I came on the, out to Texas and, and New Mexico uh, last, last month, and before I came here, so it would be about three months ago, I decided to, you know, my, I had a Facebook page, but it was only designed for, uh, because I had to get on live stream and they asked you for a Facebook page or whatever, so I, I, may, I had one, I just had a dummy picture and everything. But I was talking to one of the fellows at the bookstore. He runs actually the, he's the IT guy. I hope this, I don't know if I got this right. Here. This came loose a minute. But, uh, let me turn it on first. This came out of its bracket, so does it go like that? But uh, I decided, when he told me, he says, you know, my wife's on Facebook, and uh, through, through her, she's, she's got like, like almost 3,000, I think that might be it. I think, that, I think it goes, let me try it. It's in my pocket. Jacket pocket. Okay. Amen. But, uh, so that was the, that was the idea of, uh, with the Facebook, he said, my wife's got like 3,000 people, you know, you, you have like 100 friends, and then they have friends, and they have friends. And then uh, Brother uh, James, he has a Facebook page, and he has friends of friends of friends. So I thought, well, what I do, what I do now is when I go Beatle, I've told it, I've told it, I've given access to my Facebook page. So when I start broadcasting, it immediately pulses a message to all my Facebook friends that I'm going live. That's one way. Last night, I don't know if uh, I told you this, but last night we were also broadcasting live in Clovis, New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, a few of the folks from the church actually went to the church and started and watched the, uh, the presentation last night from Clovis, New Mexico. There were seven, but then James was also uh, recording it and sending it out on his uh, live stream um, thing called Band User. So it's a way of multiplying, multiplying. You guys, you know, it can be really amazing how much, you know, we're just in the start. I'm just starting. But, uh, yeah, that's amazing. That's a blessing to the heart to have that many people on there. Because we, uh, we started, when we left here this afternoon, we had 45 views. So that means people told their friends, told their friends, hey, you got to see this, or, you know, how do they do that? I don't know. You can send links. You have the link. You just send it to a friend. And it goes out like that. Boom, boom, boom. And then all the friend has to do, They've got a link, is, of course, hit the blue link, and they're up and running. All right, well, praise the Lord. We better get going here.
We're excited. We're excited for what the Lord has done. We want to get. We want to see if He can get done tonight. Amen. With the Lord of God. So. Hey, I'm Dr. Carl W. Deems, Burning Bright Ministries. I have a website called BurningBrightMinistries.com. <laughs> That's for Ed. That's for Ed. Anyway. There. If you just the first time, Ed wants me to talk about that website. But you get uh, there's a lot of handouts. There's uh, MP3 MP3 files that you can download. Uh, there's a lot of videos. Uh, uh, finding God's Word in the New Age, and also uh, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And uh, Lord willing, within the next week or two, uh, this Science in the Bible will be up there. And uh, so, uh, and you can contact me through that website. Uh, there's a way you can you know contact us, and you can click on if you got any questions. Those of you that are watching out there and have questions about what I've talked about, feel free to email me. I'll try to get you a response. And uh, so that's that. A brief history of modern science. We're going to finish it up today or tonight. Of course, uh, nothing. When you talk about the, the history of modern science, I said it was brief, but it, it can be long. I mean, you can go on forever. But here's our theme verses. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Psalms 19.1-3, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day are the speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. And there's supposed to be another one in there. It didn't, but... Uh, Second uh, Timothy six uh, what twenty it says beware of science falsely so called and uh, that's what you that's what you want to do let's go ahead and pray dear Heavenly Father thank you for watching out for us thank you for your protection uh, pray we uh, be a blessing to your people and to you uh, and help me have the right words to say in Jesus name Amen Amen, amen. all right so we finished here the Reformation grows tired it uh, slid into the age of enlightenment enlightenment basically was now we can think as free human beings. The 18th century in many ways is a period of optimism and an age in which reason was enthroned as the ultimate reason. That's the, you know, but there's three systems of unbelief, polytheism, yes. pantheism, and yeah. rationalism. Yeah. Yeah, that's where we're headed. Voltaire did not believe in God or what the uh, theologians of his day taught. He was against tra traditional theism. Let us be reasonable and rational, and let us not commit ourselves to anything other than that. So what he believes is people that believe in the Bible, believe in things that were supernatural, weren't rational. Uh, actually, he's the one that belongs in the rubber room. Okay? You see how that goes? It's 180 degrees out. By the way, we're going to go for a while. We're going to take a break, and then I am going to, uh, then we'll finish, we'll finish up with... Uh, the, I guess I call it the counterattack. The last uh, last message would be on the counterattack, and there's a lot of good videos on that. So, hang with me, man. This is another guy published a massive encyclopedia that recorded what Dot Dot considered real knowledge, primarily that which was derived from sense and experience and reason. And uh, he had a real hard time printing this thing because he was trying to do it without God. Amen. So it was all rational and everything. There was a large volumes and everything. And, uh, and he was uh, in France, I believe. And uh, not many people wanted to publish that thing because of the anti-God anti uh, flavor of that, that publication. Laplace, okay? He's another guy. In the 1800s, people were trying to explain the universe without an outside creator. Have you ever seen that thing of the nebula thing where there's a big thing of gas and it's kind of revolving around and then eventually you get a star and then you eventually get planets, you know? That, that works all fine except some of the planets go the wrong direction on their orbits. <laughs> yeah. All right. Of course, you know, you do the best with what you got. Amen. He's missing some of it. But anyway. He's got a fever. Uh, so he came up with the nebula hypothesis. The science of Newton and then those that followed him encouraged separation from God and the natural world. So they're trying to come up with an idea how did all this stuff happen naturally. God, God just said that he created the stars also. You realize what a, what a concept that is? Uh, if you try to use an illustration of how this all thing worked, and we were talking, uh, Sister Sharon and I were talking about, how do you, how do, you do Everything has to work right time. Magnetism. Light, gravity, uh, all the all the so-called constants, which are yeah. just are basically fudge factors that the physicists put together. All that stuff has to be right. If you're off just one over one to the ten to the you know a hundred billions, it doesn't work. You end right. up with just a, a mush. Okay. 
Okay? So it has to work right. So that means if you're going to put stars way out here and stuff, you have to have light that's coming, you know, has to make it all the way in and stuff like that. The only way I can explain it, possibly, is you have a movie set. Right? Have you ever seen, you know, what did they say? Ready, set, go, or one, two, three, action? Lights, camera, action. Lights, camera, action. Lights. <laughs> hey, hey, there you go. Lights, camera, action. So here's a movie set, right? And the actors move in there, you know? And then they get lights, camera, action. And then it starts. But the whole set is there, right? Yeah. The coffee is, the cot. Yeah. You know, you ever see the guy... You know, I, I always get a kick out you see these guys there eating in the movies. You ever notice how little they eat? You know why they eat so little? You know, eat little pieces? It's because they've had to do that thing over and over and over again. They can't keep eating, so. But that's, you know, we do it all the time with, with movies and television. But we think, man, that's taken hundreds of years, you know, for this for these trees to grow, right? On the Ponderosa. Bum, ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, you know, a hundred of years for those trees to grow and for the water and everything. No, they just painted it yesterday afternoon and put a couple of... Yeah. <laughs> and then here comes horse, and then, and then the horse comes riding in. You know? And all of a sudden, you, you know, you're back in the 1800s. How do they do that? <coughs> well, it's because it's all set up, and, it's, and then when they say lights, camera, action, boom, it goes. So just think about the universe that way. I mean, it's, you know, that's, a, that's a metaphor, analogy or something. But, okay, but they're trying to figure out, you know, this thing going. A lot of Christians are caught up in that. Now, can't, I got a lot of slides on can't. Uh, can't, <laughs> if I, and can't, can't's cosmology. Uh, that's interesting, because I got rid of this. I thought I got rid of this right here, can't's cosmology. But he's a scientific thinker. Uh, uh, he had influence on society for, for the next 200 years. He argued away Christian irrefutable arguments for the existence of God from men like Augustine and Aquinas. So he's a guy really attacking the premise of God, the idea of God, and he would go in there and he made fun of Augustine Aquinas. Well, uh, folks, they weren't the greatest rocket science uh, Bible scholars. Say the Roman Catholics back in the you know third century, whatever. Uh, they they were good in some, but you know they they weren't uh, um, couldn't rightly divide the word of truth. They're in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Augustine's a guy who gave us infant baptism to tell you how great a Bible guy he was. So, anyway, irrefutable arguments. He argued with Christian irrefutable arguments. No, he, he really didn't, because I'm still standing here. You know, I'm, and then, the universe must be infinite in both time and space. The eternity matter. Where have we heard that before? It comes from Aristotle and those guys. It comes from pantheism. It's the same old record that runs over and over again. Because they have to get rid of God, and God said, no, in the beginning, God created every earth and had a start here at the beginning. Right. All right. The theologians just quit. As a result of Kant and the complexity of the mathematics required of the realm of astronomy, right? You got this, everybody's looking at the universe. Many theologians began to yield to the beliefs of the, make, and of the makeup of the universe postulated by Kant and the indoctrinated scientists. Because they they got rid of their Bible through higher criticism. And they couldn't understand the math. They just said, well, okay, you guys tell us what it is. We'll just, we'll just take a back burner. We'll talk about, uh, we'll preach the gospel, but we're not going to really worry too much about science. Advances in technology able, enabled observable astronomy to seemingly further support the hypothesis of CAN. So, here's CAN's most directed state acronym is that Knowledge can be attained only through the human senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. How about the Holy Spirit? Yeah. yeah right. See, he didn't have the Holy Spirit. So he didn't know what we were talking about. All right. Uh, you know, there's a there's a there's an evil force out there, it's called the devil, and his devils. Uh, you talk if you want to find out so the, the witches and those guys are getting information from somewhere. A lot of the science fiction writing about things in the future and stuff, they're getting information from somewhere. Kant, in short, was totally naturalistic. And that was bad. Hume was the fellow that, um, uh, according to, to uh, Kant, was the one that opened his eyes. He says a cause can never be proved from its effect. So Hume came before Kant, uh, but uh, the idea of being 
uh, you know, when, when I go through the history of scripture corruption, there's always a teacher, and then there's a student, and then there's a student, and a teacher student. Uh, can't get a lot of his ideas or ideas that from uh, this guy Hume. Can't reject it absolutes. Flatly denied anything supernatural. He was awed by the starry heavens above and by living things around him, but he didn't understand. He didn't believe God. He defined God as the moral disposition within man, which is the basis and interpretation of religion. Uh, Kant's moral disposition. He believed that morals were for man's own good. Miracles are imagined. They overstep our reasoning. So if you can't reason it, get rid of it. Now this is the kind of uh, philosophy in all and dogma that your kids are learning when they go to college. Yeah. You know? They yeah. teach this guy. I've got a brother-in-law that learned this guy. And once this, once this is infected in your brain, very hard to win you over to Christ. Okay? You can be won over when you realize this guy was basically brain dead. But uh, that that's taught like this is man. If you don't believe this, you're you're stupid. You know, that's what they do in college. They get your kids into college, and then they bring these guys up, and they it's you know, they read they read this guy, and he sounds like he's reasonable, and they they take your kid's faith away. Yeah. This is Kant's beliefs. Man, so remember this guy can. This guy is dangerous. Man's knowledge is limited to that which he can obtain through the five human senses. A cause can never be proved from its effect. No man, uh, man has no innate ideas. No existence beyond the humanly experienced dimensions can be proved. He doesn't believe in a heaven or hell. No absolute can ever be established to exist. And yet, but is that? But he, it was funny about this. His axioms were absolute. <coughs> you know, his things were absolute, but nobody else's were. Yeah. Hello. Ding ding. <laughs> um, yeah, ding, ding, ding. I mean, come on, man. Get the straitjacket going. Miracles are illusionary and cannot be proven. Uh, ask the blind man when he went to the Pharisees. He says, I don't know how he did it, but all I know one thing. I was blind, and now I see. Amen. And if you got saved, you say, I don't know what happened exactly, but I know I was blind, but now I see. Ask Brother Spurgeon. If something happened to him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, something radically happened to him. Yeah. Yes. That you, you can't explain other than supernatural. Amen. Oh, you know, everything. How many, how many Christians you run into? Even in this meeting, well, uh, Brother Ed and I have talked about things that happened during this meeting where things have happened where the Lord threw us a bone and showed, hey, we are with you. Amen. We are watching what you're doing. Amen. Sister Sharon is an example. We were doing it, getting ready to show it. She had no idea we were getting ready to show this, uh, do this uh, uh, video oh, right, in the right. morning. And Sister Sharon calls yep. up that. I'm at getting the, ready at to put that instant. seconds of pushing the button. Right. And you, you give us a call. Yep. Well, that wasn't that a current shift to us? Because you, what she asked, what was she asking for, brother Ed? To, how to do it? How, how to, to get how in to there. do it? And I'm thinking, man, it's the middle of the day. You know, who's going to be watching or whatever? Yeah. And it's and the, and the Lord says, hey, Sharon, hey, sister Sharon, call up brother Deans and let him know that yeah. there's some people that are interested in watching this thing. Right? Yeah. We were within 30 seconds of pushing the button. Hey, Amen. She must have been looking in the window. <laughs> yeah. 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 She got a phone call from God. And, oh, all right. So this, they say that's coincidence. Hey, when those coincidences happen almost every day. Yeah. You know? Amen. Yeah. All right. This is a bunch of stuff. The development of the universe is simply mechanical. He's just basically believing the universe is not a, has not a beginning of time. The universe is infinite and extent. Wrong. Time and space are strictly relative. Everything about and in the universe can be explained by the laws of physics. No, no. they can't. I got so many on this guy. No existence beyond human, humanly experienced dimensions can be proved. Therefore, here he goes. No absolutes can be established. He says, everything about in the universe can be explained by the laws of physics. Miracles are illusionary and cannot be proven. I think it's a double, double slide there. But the idea being, he's a fool according to the Bible. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, and God has showed it unto them. Amen. God has told us that he showed can't. 
He exists. Kant decided, I don't want to believe it. I don't see no evil, hear no evil, yeah. speak no evil. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. For the invisible things, uh, 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 uh. Paul wrote in the first century, he knew Kant was down the road. Yeah, yeah. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, Paul believed in the creation. I would like to see Paul uh, uh, sit with Kant and have Kant try to tell him, mm. after you've been to the, the third heaven. It didn't yeah. exist, amen. I'd like to see that happen. <laughs> that being a conversation. <laughs> For the creation of the world are clearly seen. We see these things, Mr. Yeah. Kant. Yeah. We right. see these things. You say, how can you see them? I, don't, I can't explain it to you, man. Amen. But I know they're there. Amen. They are there. It's spiritual. Yeah. Yes. The New Testament is spiritual. Old Testament, everything, the tabernacle, the miracles, all, they are physical. For those Jews to see physical things. But when you're in the New Testament, man, it is spiritual. It's a spiritual warfare we are yeah, fighting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. World clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Paul says, you, you, you see all that. So that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Amen. In the first century. And you and I know that's exactly right. Amen. We know it's right. And it's not wrong for us. Uh, so that's not a problem. James Hutton. Now this is a guy, this is the beginning of uniformitarianism. This is, we're getting down, I think it's 1700s. James Hutton was a geologist, a deist, a naturalist, promoted the idea of uniform, the earth, we, uniformitarianism. The earth we see today was produced from geological processes that we can observe today. In other words, he went to the river and he saw the Sediment yeah. being pour, poured out, and it was a real slow process. So he said, "Well, you know, everything's the same as it always been. So it probably took millions of years to make this canyon. Probably took millions of years etc., <laughs> to to uh, put all this uh, silt down." This is in direct conflict with the Genesis account. The biblical view is catastrophic. Yeah. 1785. Okay, Hutton, when Hutton proposed this theory, he came under attack. You know why he came under attack? Because what he was doing, he was attacking the Bible. And, he knew, and people knew what it would do, it would bankrupt society. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking up their own lusts, we saw this verse before, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That was written by Peter, the fisherman, with no college education, in the first century, he said, there'll be come a day where they'll say, scoffers coming at their own lust, and they're going to say, everything has been the same since. Now, how, how's that for something supernatural? How do you yeah, know yeah, yeah. How do you know this guy Hutton would show up or, and, uh, and Kant and all these guys? How do you know? Because God told them. Supernatural. Right. Right. As they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willingly, willingly are ignorant of. It's like that... Uh, Richard Dawkins. He says, I know that there's design, I see apparent design, but I'm not going to believe there's a designer. Yeah. It's a yeah. blind watchmaker. Yeah. Yeah. Don't confuse that me. By the word of the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out, out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. By the biblical view of the world is catastrophic. Yeah, yeah, things happen yeah. catastrophic. Here's Mount St. Helens. <coughs> if I didn't tell you that was Mount St. Helens, you can kind of see the layers here. Mm -hmm. right. That was created in less than a week. What would a geologist look at? He'd say, well, this is pre-Cambrium, this is the ump the ump layer, this is the layer, yeah. boom, 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 and they'd be looking for fossils in here. You know what, they probably would find fossils in here. That was Mount St. Helens. Everybody remember Mount St. Helens, the, the thing that blew up?
Can we turn the light down? Here? crashing up onto that area and, it, and scoured it of logs and the logs landed back in the lake. That's where the trees came from to form the log map this day, these days on the Spirit Lake. In the middle of the picture here, this bench was scoured by the, um, by the wave that came up here and a giant... That's Mount St. Helens. That canyon was made almost, you know, in a week, less than a week. This area of Helens, uh, north of Mount St. Helens, was the inside, a site of intense uh, uh, geologic activity. Up to 600 feet of strata formed here at this location. 600 feet of strata is, is a hard to believe, but since 1980, since May 18, 1980, up to 600 feet of deposits have formed here. And this area has been eroded since then to uh, show us some of the uh, 600 feet of deposits that have formed here. What's amazing is the uh, minute layering that formed in uh, some of these deposits. We have historic observation and eyewitness reports and photographs of this area repeatedly between the eruptions, showing us the sequence of which these deposits formed. Each layer has a date, and I'm fascinated as I study these layers because each layer represents a geologic catastrophe formed since 1980. May, uh, the, the one that comes to my mind most uh, uh, here is behind us. We see this layer, June 12, 1980, pumice flow deposit. Hurricane velocity surging flows from the crater of Mount St. Helens came surging down right over this area in a matter of hours, deposited 25 feet in thickness of strata and minutely layered strata. I had thought that a volcanic eruption would form hom a homogenized series of deposits. What was I wrong? Here are these, uh, these flows moving at twice freeway speed through this area deposit this minutely layered uh, deposit. Uh, there are mud flow deposits here. There is the nine hour uh, eruption deposit from uh, the uh, nine hour eruption on May 18th. There's all kinds of uh, interesting features. This is, a, this is a wonderland for geologists to study. If you were here watching the, uh, the June 12, 1980 pumice flow deposit, fully dead, okay, it was that hazardous of an environment, nobody actually saw the individual layers form. Underneath this uh, ground-hugging cloud of volcanic ash and steam, I suppose, uh, this layer formed. We believe it took minutes for individual layers to form. I like that. That's pulses. The eruption occurred in pulses, and this material came sliding down through this area. And uh, that's how we got the, uh, each, each, each of these layers. I had thought that a catastrophe would homogenize things. And I had thought that layers formed slowly and gradually, like between wet years and dry years, or between summer and winter. And the boundary between two adjacent strata would represent long periods of inactivity, perhaps uh, um, you know, hundreds of years of nothing going on. Boy, was I wrong. Look at this. Uh, 25 feet of layers formed in just a matter of hours here at the volcano. Not only did we have uh, lake erosion, but we had very severe uh, canyon erosion. I was able to go up near the crater, and on several occasions I got into these new canyons. We had eyewitness reports and photographic documentation that these canyons were not there before the eruption. This canyon was eroded through solid rock over 100 feet deep, after the summer of 1980 by some mysterious agent. There is an ancient lava flow, an ancient volcanic landslide deposit, an ancient volcanic ash layer. All those were gouged out mysteriously by some mysterious agent after the summer of 1980. Uh, this helicopter shot shows uh, one of these canyons. An incredible uh, new canyon system has formed right there through solid rock. You see the waterfall coming through. In other words, it didn't take millions of years to happen. Through there. Again, solid rock was gouged out by catastrophic agents. If I had not known about mountains and I ventured on this canyon, I might assume that that canyon was formed one sand grain at a time as it was eroded slowly by that stream. That's the way it might appear. But we have the uh, documentation that this canyon was opened up rapidly and formed by catastrophic agents, not by slow and gradual agents over enormous periods of time. Okay, here's Mount St. Helens. Uh, <coughs> get the lights there, brother. Ed. 
Here's Mount St. Helens. Here's all the here's all these trees and logs and everything, right? Forming one big layer. Look at all the logs that came as a result of that. Here's the logs in horizontal. There's fossils that they found that are in multiple layers of strata. Fossil trees. And they're, they're straight up and down. Well, here's an example of how they happen. And actually, uh, they've seen that, that, that process work on St. Helens where the log is, goes down and then it's covered with silt and it just takes, doesn't take hardly any time at all and it's covered. Yeah. Vertical. Okay. All right, here we go. Another, another video. <laughs> All right, here's polystrata fossils. All that, that's poly means many. So here's a fossil that's in many layers. Most people are under the impression that coal formed slowly in swamps over millions of years, but this view neglects the testimony of tree trunk fossils that cut across many coal layers, known as polystrate fossils. If these tree trunks were buried gradually over thousands of years, the top parts of the trees would have rotted away before they could be protected by sediment. Derek Ager, professor of geology at University College of Swansea, recognised this when he wrote of trees buried in coal seams. If one estimates the total thickness of the British coal measure as about a thousand meters laid down in about 10 million years, then assuming a constant rate of sedimentation, it would have taken 100,000 years to bury a tree meters high, which is ridiculous. He then went on to say, we cannot escape the conclusion that sedimentation was at times very rapid indeed. So the slow swamp story should itself be laid to rest. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So Charles Lyell wrote the principles of geology in 1830. He assumed the principle of uniformity. What did we just see? We can't assume that at all. In fact, uh, there is a theory out there, maybe it's actually they decided it's fact, but now they realize the Grand Canyon was formed by a catastrophe. There was a big lake in the middle of the United States. There's a big dam, and they think that the dam broke, and that's what caused the Grand Canyon. Anybody hear that? It didn't take millions and millions of years, but yeah, that's what it is. And uh, so, the uh, principle of uniformity, they're not, uh, uh, they're, of course, you know, you're talking about 1830. The hymn, whatever that is, was abhorrent. Why? Because that matched the Bible. They believe, they, they probably come up, if, if, the, if the, the old black book wasn't there, they'd probably come up with the right answer. But they can't come up, they don't want to believe the book. Yeah. They assume strata laid down over time, vast periods of time required. All right. Let me see something. I'm, what I'm going to do is here, I want to lie. Uniformitarianism, you know about that. What the Bible says, I've pretty much gone over that. But we probably should, we probably should cover that. Everything is important, right? Uh, Bible. Let's get into Darwin. Okay, let's get into Darwin. And then we'll, we'll take it. You know, the Bible, I, I've said it, you know, Bible says this, Bible says it's catastrophic. Uniformitarianism says it wasn't. You know, we'll just leave it at that. But, uh, you got your notes, right? Everybody got your notes? So it's in there, okay? Believe it. That, so, even though I covered it. Charles Darwin did for biology what Hutton and G and did what Hutton, what Hutton did for, for uh, geology. Uh, what Hutton and Lyle did for geology and Newton did for physics. In other words, he explained things in terms of presently known forces. He was trying to explain without God. He took a trip on a ship called the Beagle. He wrote On the Origin of Species in 1859. So where are we now? That's, uh, uh, that's 150 years or so. Okay. Evolutionary model. Changes and variations in population. Survival of the fittest. Me first, you last. Okay. So I have to explain the differences in the species in terms of presently observable forces. He saw variations in populations like cows, horses, pitches when he was on the, on the island there. And he says, you know, he, he tried to extrapolate that to making species. Uh, talked about that earlier. Okay, I think this is, this is a good movie. Okay, here we go, Ed. Read. <laughs> Here's the finches. In 1994, journalist Jonathan Weiner published The Beak of the Finch, a book about research into finches on the Galapagos Islands. It won the Pulitzer Prize. 
Weiner argued that finches represent the best and most detailed demonstration to date of the power of Darwin's process of natural selection. If it is, they're in a world Similar of claims are made in many biology textbooks. The Galapagos finches are a spectacular example of evolution. When the food quality, in other words, the kind of food that was available changed as a result of a drought or a particular rainy year or something like that, over the course of history, they could see dramatic changes in the beak sizes in various populations. Natural selection can drive changes of structure, like the beak, in one direction in response to selective pressure, not just fast enough to account for what would be required for Darwin's theories, but actually, 50 to 100 times faster than that. A severe drought could cause many of the finches to die and leave only those with larger beaks. So in the following generation, the average beak size was increased. And some textbooks extrapolate this over this is 200 Dr. years Lewis. or so and say that a few of these events from the first the guy was an evolutionist. transform these finches into a new species by making their beaks larger. Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not confuse ourselves about that. How should this kind of be extrapolated? Or does it represent cyclic variation? What the books fail to mention is that as soon as the rains came back, the average beak size returned to normal. There was no net evolution. What we're really seeing is just one species oscillating back and forth with no real evolutionary change. So the evidence is exaggerated to make it appear to support Darwin's theory in a way that it really doesn't. The contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years, there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. There's a whole lot more, by way of evidence, of a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more. This is to be serious science. And this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Um, finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape. It seems to be correlated with seasons. There seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the season changes. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. The changes are temporary, they oscillate back and forth, and they don't go anywhere. So, as evidence for the origin of species, Darwin's finches uh, really don't work. Critics of Darwin's theory say that finch beaks provide a good example of micro-evolution, small changes within a species or gene pool. But it does not by itself provide evidence for macroevolution, which is the origin of fundamentally new organisms and body plans. Microevolution is what we can demonstrate in the laboratory in real time with organisms changing due to different environments. The extrapolation you know, to macroevolution is a quantum leap. Look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs. And look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of inherent species limitation. And we have no good explanation for this in terms of the Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. Okay. That's a taste of what some of the stuff you're going to see uh, in the next hour. Okay. The Bible says man was made in the image of God. Man is a lost sinner. Man needs pardon for sin. Each person is a value in the universe. God is a definite plan for humanity. Man is an eternal soul, a proper understanding of the supernatural. Evolution says man was made in the image of beasts. Man is the pinnacle of evolutionary perfection. A man is a master of his individual... The individual is a little value. There is no purpose, no direction in man's history. Man ceases to exist when he dies. The supernatural does not exist. Mm -hmm. False, 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 false. Zero. Zero. The results of Darwinism gave the unregenerate sinner a scientific reason to throw God out and by default the Bible. You don't want to be convicted of your sins. Yeah. You don't want to be responsible for your sins. So throw God and the Bible out. Hey, guess what? 
when you jump off a building, whether you believe in gravity or not, yeah, it will show affect up. you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I like what uh, uh, Hovine says, uh, I can't remember, Dr. Ken Hovine, he says, uh, you know, a thief doesn't look for a policeman, right? That's, and it doesn't look for God, for about the same reason, amen? <laughs> This Darwinism is morphed into a religion that must be accepted by everybody in society. It must be accepted. Why are we talking about that, John? You force me, when I go to college, I have to believe that. For real. Yep. You force me in order, in order to be a, a tenured university professor, I have to believe that. I don't have to be believed to be a Muslim, you know. But you have to believe this religion. That's all it is. It's a dogma. It's a religion. Darwinism. Pantheism. When you have a pantheistic and a polytheistic and a humanistic and atheist religions and the worldviews, they're always Darwinistic. Darwinism, who would want to get rid of the Creator? The devil. Yeah. Darwin has eventually replaced the Bible in society, scientific academies, institutes of higher learning, and public school systems. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, the Scopes Monkey trial in 1920, they tried to make, well, they did. They made fun of Bible-believing Christians. They brought in all these scientists, and they brought in their so-called proof of evolution and tried to make fun. Uh, it was John Thomas, Thomas Scope, the defendant. Uh, they're not even sure he actually taught uh, evolution in the classroom. They just used him as a, as a person, right? So like the Jane Doe of uh, the abortion thing. William Jennings Bryan, why I say about Jane Doe, the reason they one of the, they brought Jane Doe before the court and they said she had been raped by a black man and was having a baby by a black man. Listen, folks, that's what I'm telling you. He was raped by a black man and he tried to get on the, what do you call it, the heartstrings of the people. She was a white woman. Now, who's, who's the racist and all that thing? Hero. See? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's how they got abortion through. And later on, she later recanted, and that was all a false story. Yeah. That was a lie. Mm -hmm. William Shane Bryant was the prosecutor. Clarence Darrow was the defense. ACLU used scopes to attack the law, and that they actually, he, he actually pleaded uh, guilty, and they fined him a hundred bucks or something, just so that he wouldn't have to defend himself. In the late 1800s, Newton's laws of motion were fixed. Maxwell's equations of electron and magnets were well established. The physics were feeling pretty comfortable and complacent. There's no more we can learn. That's what they were feeling in the late 1800s. But there were three discoveries that turned things on its head. Heat transfer by radiation, gravitational potential paradox, which meant, and uh, it's hard to explain, but uh, in an in a infinite universe, you would have an infinite amount of gravity, or something like that. Or, uh, um, uh, it, went to, it went to infinity, which we obviously doesn't because we're walking around. And then the Michael Morley experiment, that was another experiment where they were, they were trying to see if the, as the Earth was orbiting the sun, they were trying to see about light, they would see if they, they could find the ether. And they put the, let's just say they put the two beams of light in perpendicular, et cetera, et cetera. But they didn't find any ether. And what they found that if there's, and they found that there was no motion uh, and they said, oh, wait a minute. Light is traveling the same speed no matter what reference it's going. Let's just build that one. Heat transfer by radiation. Uh, that was a bad thing for a, a universe that was supposed to exist forever and ever and ever, right? Those are three discoveries right around the turn of the century that turned science up on its head. See what time it is. Okay, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll finish up uh, on. Um, oh, advertise burningbrightministries.com. Yes, sir. Burningbrightministries.com. Go there, and uh, but anyway, we'll finish up with uh, the counterattack. Okay.